and and you know to this day i still have not come across an area of research that is you know comparably impactful maybe al alternative energy sources or some you know major step nuclear fusion step change in, in all of civilization but setting that aside we already have the proof of principle that we can extend healthy lifespan in mice so it's just a matter of time until we make this happen in humans but again the incentive structure is so messed up in the medical system you know it's pay for palliating symptoms it's not pay for preventing disease or slowing aging so um and, and similarly a lot of broken incentives in the research side but in the last five or ten years we've seen this enormous increase in interest in longevity and geroscience and a lot of capital flood flooding into the space as well so i'm pretty optimistic Hi, everyone, and welcome to the very first episode of the DSI podcast. I'm Alex. I'll be your host for today, and I'm excited to be here because we have a great set of guests to kick us off. Tim Peterson is assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at Washington University, St. Louis. In his lab, he and his team study genomics and the metabolomics of aging and mental health. In addition, he's the founder and CEO of HealthSpan Technologies, a biotechnology research company using vaccination to tackle age-related diseases. He's also a member of Vita Dow's Longevity Working Group. Previously, he was a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard. Sebastian Brunmeier is co-founder and general partner of HealthSpan Capital, a venture fund focused on longevity biotech and geroscience. He's also CEO and founder of ImmuneAge Pharma, a company focused on immune system rejuvenation. He was co-founder and chief investment officer at Cambrian Biopharma, co-founder and COO of Samsara Therapeutics, and principal at Apollo Health Ventures. His education includes dropping out of a PhD in biochemistry of aging at the University of Oxford as a Clarendon Scholar. Lawrence Ion is deal flow steward at Vita Dow and the director of Vitality Healthspan Foundation, a nonprofit working to advance the development of biomedical interventions that address age-related diseases for the purpose of improving healthspan. Today, we spoke about why decentralized science matters, research and longevity, and the future of the space as a whole. Hope you enjoy. Uh, Tim, Lawrence, Sebastian, thank you all so much for making the time. Uh, you know, it seems like we're all sort of scattered across the globe. So after some coordination on everyone's part, it's great to get the opportunity to sit down and chat. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So, you know, I think it'd be great to start by hearing some brief introductions from each of you just about your path up to this point and any projects you're involved in, including how you got involved in Molecules Ecosystem and uh, what that involvement across projects looks like. Sure, yeah. I guess. Yeah, so I, I can start. I mean, it's, I'm more the uh, kind, of, kind of the old guy in the room. I, you know, definitely been part of the trad sci um, for, for a couple decades now and seen all the, seen all the issues. So my interest in, in Vita Dow and Molecule and DSI in general, just stems from, you know, kind of having lived through the, the old system and um, being at universities and publishing and getting grants and all that stuff. So I've seen kind of all the pain points. And so, you know, I'm optimistic that with, with crypto and, you know, new, new mechanisms of coordination, we can solve, hopefully make some progress on a lot of those issues. So. And, and Tim, you have a very, uh, cool and prestigious cv do you want to elaborate on some of the stuff you've yeah. done or the places you've been no i mean actually one of the cool things i think about crypto is no one cares about that stuff so that's actually that's kind of i think the uh the um that's kind of one of the more refreshing things is you know actually people can um you know certainly obviously experience helps but um but usually i think people take each other at face value a little more of course crypto there's a lot of anonymous uh, contributors and stuff like that so um, definitely helps to having been trained at, you know, no, no one's wants to throw out the traditional world. Um, but, um, and certainly I wouldn't be here today without kind of a lot, a lot of the traditional credentials, but, um, but I think that's one of the major strengths is that everyone is, it's kind of a little more of a level playing field and, and people can, can rise up, you know, you know, uh, without kind of those barriers. So. He's quite humble, it seems, but he can't escape the voiceover intro that I'm going to do at the beginning of the episode. All so. right, good, good. Yeah, right. we can't let him get away with that. Sebastian, you wanna you wanna lead us on here? Sure. Yeah. So, um, I am Sebastian Brunemeyer. I'm a biomedical scientist by training. 
I've spent most of my career in the longevity biotech space, uh, a lot of it at the lab bench, suffering through a lot of the um, inefficiencies of their traditional R&D system. Um, you know, I studied in the US, studied in Europe, uh, dropped out of a PhD program at Oxford to launch a big longevity biotech company. Um, and I've since lost, launched three biotech companies all in the longevity space. And I um, was one of the earliest employees at Apollo Health Ventures, which is today the largest aging focused venture fund with 200 million under management. So, you know, I, I know um, what it's like to be really early in an interesting new trend. In that case, it was longevity. And I'm seeing the same indications uh, in the DSI space. So, um, so yeah, I've, I've been helping out with VitaDAO and the deal flow and diligencing some of these projects. And I've been advising molecules since the early days. Cool. Yeah. I, um, I'm a guy who just loves the scientific method, tries to apply it in every aspect of my thinking, including to what I spend my time on to make the big uh, impact. So I started out in IT initially, computer science. I loved sort of like solving problems with just my laptop. I didn't really see a high impact way to contribute to medicine, even though that was really important to me. Um, but eventually I realized just coding isn't solving anything. So I became an entrepreneur um, um, to, to actually bring products to people and actually solve problems and, and then an investor to kind of diversify the, the impact. And it's sort of a combination of more of an entrepreneurial type of investor with, especially now with being um, a deal flow steward in, in VitaDAO, just like Tim. Um, and we've been, steward means just, we've been around from the beginning and, and uh, or, or longer than most members. So we can sort of support them and, and steward this working group so that it you know, meets the, the goals for, for, for the DAO. And um, yeah, I'll get into what what Vida Dao is doing um, afterwards. But um, yeah, sweet. Well, I think that's a good way to kick us off. Uh, but you know, first things first, we're here talking about decentralized science, right? About DSI. Uh, so, for anyone uh, listening in who's unfamiliar, what is DSI? What does that mean? What are we talking about here today? Yeah, so I can lead with that. I think we all have kind of our own takes on that. Um, I think the, the what I've been thinking about, um, you know, is, is kind of what I said more at the beginning is like, there's a lot of places in, in academia and in biotech where there's, where there's not, you know, there's not an incentive. Often that means, you know, money, you know, there's not really a real clear incentive for people to, to take initiative and get things done. So it'd be a DAO where, you know, really tackling this valley of death where, You've got a you know really strong science project at a university, and and getting that into a, you know a biotech or a big pharma company where they can really you know get it out to the world. You know, there's this, this kind of valley of death where projects go to die. So by basically by by putting money into the into the system at that spot and helping kind of shepherd people along, um, you know, through this valley of death, um, that's where we're making hopefully hoping to make a big impact. So there's obviously many other kind of pain points and places where there isn't proper incentives. And I think that's where the broader D, D, um, D site uh, infrastructure can, can um, make some impact. Um, but that's, you know, definitely the, the, the Valley of death is where Vita Dow is spending a lot of time. So. Agreed. And, and to add on to that, um, another definition for D side is a system for funding and executing R and D without relying on the government, big corporation or big corporations, which have a perverse incentive system. They have not integrated technology rapidly and they have not been efficiently serving public health, either the taxpayer money or the shareholder money. Um, and so, you know, we've taken upon ourselves to fund some of these valley of death ideas, these high risk, high return ideas that maybe fall outside of the traditional scientific dogma for centuries you know, we always have these scientific reigning dogmas and they get overturned, but it's, it's, it's a war every single time. And so wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to centralize all of our uh, decision-making power into these elite people who, who preserve these dogmas, but we can fund a lot of radical ideas in a decentralized way and let a thousand flowers bloom as it were. So. 
You know, another question more broadly that I think would be interesting is understanding what got each of you interested in some of the themes we're going to be talking about today, you know, molecular biology, biotech, research, longevity. Uh, where and when did some of those interests arise for each of you? Yeah, so I guess if, I, if I'm kind of first in line, I um, I think one in my background came from, I studied this pretty uh, well-known longevity pathway called the mTOR pathway. So this is targeted by the drug rapamycin. So I got into that space in, in grad school about 20 years ago, and it wasn't really the space, you know, really wasn't uh, well-known at all. So we did, none of us really thought we were studying longevity, but um, the field has kind of evolved and mTOR has gotten more important. And so that's, that's kind of how I got into it. And then, um, you know, just been kind of in the space kind of increasingly so ever since. So, Go ahead, Lawrence. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I was just thinking, um, I'm not sure if I would have been inter so interested in, in biology otherwise, but obviously one potential catalyst there was that I've had a lot of health issues as I was growing up. Um, many hospitalizations, many surgeries, I have a genetic condition, but either way, just thought biology is, is just super interesting. Um, more, more the sort of understanding how human body works and, and, and biological systems as well, life, um, how a cell is created is just, um, just, just happens out of the, the forces, uh, the molecular forces. Things like that are just super interesting to me and how would things work, not necessarily the, the, the way things are named with Latin names in medicine or so on. That was a bit of a turnoff for me. But anyway, po point is um, this idea of bringing aging out of medical control is definitely the, the most important thing to me um, with my sort of background of having all those health issues. I can sort of foresee, well, I'm going to get older and I'm going to have uh, I'm going to be in a poor state of health. I'm going to be in pain and eventually we're going to die. So <clears throat> that, that was just, uh, I think first time I, I realized that when I was a kid, of course, um, I had just this sort of black hole in, in the middle of my chest and, and just staring into the abyss. So like, okay, this is so crazy, but then put it out of my mind, like everyone else. Uh, but eventually getting the, um, yeah, just sort of getting the courage to think about it again and and uh, and want to actually help the the field to bring in aging under medical control that it is yes feasible and it is also desirable um so so that's why i'm spending basically all my efforts on on longevity cool as am i um I, I often say I'm spoiled for any other topic. I'll never be able to work on anything else in my life because of how impactful longevity is. Um, similar to Lawrence, you know, when I was young, I had exposure to the medical system and, you know, family members were, were doctors and stuff like that. Uh, and, you know, I, I'd always been interested, but around high school, I started to realize that the medical system is not very effective. Um, at treating the most common diseases, um, age-related diseases specifically, you know, we kind of we kind of palliate the symptoms and prolong unhealthy life after most of the damage has been done. But what if we could actually prevent the damage from occurring and extend healthy lifespan? Um, and it's possible. In animals, we can already extend their healthy lifespan by about one third through maybe about a dozen different types of interventions, pharmacological diet and lifestyle interventions that can be combined for synergy. So, you know, I was wondering why, why isn't everybody doing this? Why isn't this the basis of the entire medical system? Um, and, you know, I thought I wanted to be a medical doctor. I realized that, that it, you know, it wasn't for me. It was, you know, basically um, trying to solve problems long after they've, they've occurred. Um, and, and I got really interested in, uh, longevity, but but I was actually first brought onto the scientific sort in this, the world of science, being interested in science uh, because of psychedelics. Uh, taking psychedelics sort of opened my mind to, wow, how is it possible that this simple chemical structure could elicit these incredible changes in consciousness um, and, and these incredible breakthroughs? I mean, many scientific breakthroughs have been made uh, in large, you know, thanks to psychedelics. So. Um, so that got me on the path and I started working in the lab, 
working on various areas of um, longevity biology, sirtuins and caloric restriction, telomere biology, cellular senescence, autophagy, et cetera. Um, and, and, you know, to this day, I still have not come across an area of research that is, you know, comparably impactful, maybe al alternative energy sources or some, you know, major step nuclear fusion step change in, in all of civilization. But setting that aside, we already have the proof of principle that we can extend healthy lifespan in mice. So it's just a matter of time until we make this happen in humans. But again, the incentive structure is so messed up in the medical system. You know, it's pay for palliating symptoms. It's not pay for preventing disease or slowing aging. So, um, and, and similarly, a lot of broken incentives in the research side. But in the last five or 10 years, we've seen this enormous increase in interest in longevity and geroscience and a lot of capital flood flooding into the space as well. So I'm pretty optimistic. And by the way, this point is very important. And I think most people in pharma actually don't know that there are so many pharmacological interventions. I think this, this can, I've seen it change people's uh, minds a little bit like, oh, really? We can actually um, change aging. Uh, we can intervene there. And, and it's, it's been done in, in animals. Okay. Um, and, and then the other thing that I wanted to mention, Sebastian, once we reach sort of longevity escape velocity, and this is sort of a solved problem. Would you really work on this as well the rest of your life or where would you find other fun projects? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Fair point. So in, in the base case, I'm assuming that I will be fairly, fairly old uh, biologically by the time we really come close to longevity escape velocity, velocity. but in the upside case, um, the optimistic case, if it's in the next, you know, 20, years or so that we really are close to escape velocity. Yeah. I'm sure I would probably just focus on my, I don't know, uh, my poetry career or my <laughs> interpretive dance career, something like that. Yeah. I, I'd certainly find something else to keep me busy, uh, in all seriousness, maybe like, um, you know, uh, probably energy, right. I mean, as we're seeing with all the spiking energy costs, just messing up the whole global economic system, um, you know, civilizations are, are based on their energy source. So, I would probably spend some time on alternative sources of energy. But. Sebastian, very quickly before we move on, do you want to give a quick definition of what longevity escape velocity is for anybody listening who might not know? Sure. Yeah, we should. Sorry about that. We should always define terms. Um, longevity escape velocity. Um, I first heard it from Aubrey de Grey, uh, and it basically is, although I don't know if he originated it, uh, but basically it is um, the once your rate of lifespan extension per year exceeds one year, uh, then you're, you're functionally immortal. So basically it's like, um, can the pace of longevity enhancement or extension outpace the natural ticking of your biological clock? So if you live one year longer per year, per calendar year, um, you're actually getting ahead of the pace of aging. And escape velocity is a term in astrophysics where you're know, rocketry, where you have to be going in a certain pace to escape the gravitational field of the earth or whatever. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we envision that this will come at some point. I mean, that's kind of like the singularity moment. It's the deus ex machina uh, of longevity. And it's possible that it could happen with just, with just one significant breakthrough. I mean, one of those breakthroughs could be solving the gene therapy problem, uh, which, which comes in multiple flavors. But the main problem is um, current gene therapy vectors, delivery vectors like AAVs, adeno-associated viruses, just don't transduce or don't transfect enough cells in the body to actually elicit a, a big enough difference. It's localized and ends up in the liver. So if we could solve that, if we could deliver genes, genetic material to most of the cells in the body, then that's a new ballpark. Um, and that would enable us to do things, for example, like Yamanaka reprogramming, these transient reprogramming uh, that, that has everybody excited and billions of dollars being invested, like in Altos Labs recently, that attract this company, Altos Labs, came out of the gate with $2 billion in, in venture financing. It was the largest initial financing. I struggle to call it a seed financing of all time. Um, and it, it recruited very prominent people like Hal Barron, who is 
was the CSO of GSK, GlaxoSmithKline, one of the biggest pharma companies. And he had previously been a senior executive at Calico, which was Google's $2 billion aging company. Um, so uh, Yamanaka reprogramming could be one of those major step changes that just one year works. Um, but even then, it, it will take some years to be rolled out to the general population through the normal healthcare system. Um, I'm actually a little bit of a reprogramming skeptic. I think it's amazing, but not nearly as amazing as everyone claims, similar to CRISPR, for example, um, which is an ex excellent research tool, which is very hard to use in vivo presently. Um, and, and one of the main problems with Yamanaka reprogramming is that it doesn't repair DNA damage. So mutations in your genome are not fixed. So you would still expect a significant amount of cancer, for example, from these somatic mutations. So anyway, a bit of a tangent, but that's longevity escape velocity. And it, it could happen with some incredible single breakthrough. But I think more likely it'll be just a sequence of relatively incremental advances, right? Like if we, if we make a low toxicity version of rapamycin and we get everybody on that who has certain pro-inflammatory aging biomarkers, kind of like we put people on statins, probably mistakenly on statins or on metformin for metabolic syndrome. Um, so, so these are the kind of slow, slow changes that are, I think are going to roll out over the next couple of decades. Exactly. We slowly accelerate towards escape velocity. It's not going to be a magic pill that just makes us live to a, a thousand years. That's very, very unlikely, right? But, but sort of improving it and, and getting another a uh, few decades of, of healthy life or, you know, even a decade of healthy life. And then in that decade, we have more improvement and so on. And, and as Sebastian said, each year, more than one year in, in extension. Uh, and that's, that seems tractable now. So that's, that's why it's, this concept is very important for people to grasp. So we've come across the one year anniversary of Vita Dao, and this is Molecule's podcast after all. So to set the stage for our listeners here a little bit, why don't we start uh, by talking a little bit about what Vita Dao is and of course how Molecule is related. Um, who wants to take this one? Sure, I can, I can take this one. Um, it's uh, the f sort of the first uh, decentralized community or DAO to fund real world research. And we focus on funding longevity research to create therapeutics that target aging um, and, and advance these. Uh, so, so advance the, the research through the value of death, as, as uh, Tim mentioned, that's one of the important things and, and be faster than, than the usual grants that you, you would get and definitely focus on the translational aspects so that we actually get therapeutics, the medicine that we can take and anyone can contribute funding and then anyone can receive funding. Tim, anything to anything to add on there? I mean, main thing is, you know, we're a big, huge community, over 5,000 people. So, you know, and tons of, you know, people with, with, with great credentials all over the world. So, you know, main thing is we're a community of people. So we do provide funding, but we also provide incubation and, you know, create awareness around longevity. So because of our large community, we, you know, uh, have a lot of helping hands. I think that's, that's another big differentiator from us compared with, you know, other traditional organizations who are just maybe purely money or kind of purely, you know, purely awareness. So, and then how is molecule involved here? What's the ecosystem look like? How do you describe that to people? Sure. I can take that. And, and just on, on Vita Dao, I want to highlight some more important aspects. So um, any organization is only as good as the people that comprise it. And we, I've been impressed, you know, in just one year, we've got incredible people, you know, professors at top institutions uh, like Tim, for example, but many of them, we have biotech VCs, successful biotech founders. Um, we have a uh, partnership in discussions with uh, one of the biggest pharma's venture, uh, corporate venture arms. Uh, we have, you know, some of the most prominent professors in the longevity space, uh, partnering with us as well. So I'm just blown away that in only a year, and you know, we started out in a much less organized fashion than we are today, and we're still improving, um, that we've been able to gain so much traction so rapidly. Uh, certainly, we were helped by dynamics in the Web3 crypto space uh, that have now you know, declined a little bit, but I think it's, it's coming back. I mean, Web3 is not going anywhere. Um, and, and one of the cool things about the VitaDAO model is I think it a little of it a little bit like a decentralized venture fund, and uh, there is a governance token, and the value of that government governance token 
we you know, expect to rise because we're investing in a whole lot of different projects, a highly diversified portfolio all over the world. And we're attaching royalty rights to the intellectual property uh, such that we can sell those to a, part- a partner uh, or we can spin out our own companies. We're in the process of spinning out our first company now in the extracellular matrix. Um, so, you know, it, it's anticipated that as the token value appreciates, as our portfolio value appreciates and, and capital comes back as we sell off companies, um, that will just be recycled in an evergreen fund structure so we can continue to deploy and continue to just create this massive snowball effect. And, you know, maybe within five or 10 years, we're going to be as big as the NIH, you know, giving out, and the NIH gives about almost $50 billion a year. I mean, I don't know if we'll get that, that close, but, you know, it could be a significant amount of capital going forward and it won't be, it'll be much more democratic, right? We all vote on everything. Everybody has a vote. And so it's not like at the NIH, where if you're a super prominent, powerful person, uh, you get to influence where the capital is going. Right now, we we have a very democratic structure. So um, so those are some of the things that excite me about VitaDAO. Um, as for Molecule, uh, Molecule is uh, a technology partner of VitaDAO. So Molecule provides the infrastructure, uh, legal and technological infrastructure for setting up DAOs, um, sort of like a DAO factory. And VitaDAO is not the only DAO, it was the first and thus far the most successful, um, but Molecule has a handful of others, which we can get into. Um, and in addition to being this sort of infrastructure partner, uh, if anybody wants to create a DAO, you know, I, if I wanted to create a DAO, I wouldn't know where to begin, basically. Uh, but they know all of the sort of back-end technological requirements um, and also, you know, sort of promoting and, and raising awareness uh, about these organizations. In addition to that, so that's the DAO Foundry side. Another side is um, the what, what I call an eBay for intellectual property uh, or an Amazon for, for IP. Um, right now, there's, there's no really functional central database for discovering intellectual property in the biotech space in particular. If you, if you want it, so for example, speaking from my own experience in venture and being a company founder, you know, if I wanted to find uh, an asset that say enhances autophagy and mimics caloric restriction, um, I would have to go through the academic literature, journal by journal. I'd have to contact different university tech transfer offices. Um, I'd have to go to conferences and sort of uh, discover these in, in sort of a, a very haphazard way. But what if I could just do the equivalent of a Google search, autophagy enhancing small molecules, and you know it would turn up all of these professors who had assets already available for licensing um, or had projects that with a certain amount of funding, maybe a couple hundred grand of funding, could get to a point where they had intellectual property that's relevant to my interests. So not only is this improving the sort of post hoc licensing process uh, that's already going strong, but it actually provides a new source of capital for people uh, who are looking for grant funding, basically. And attached to that grant is a royalty agreement, a licensing agreement. So, um, so the eBay for IP is just a really straightforward searchable database for intellectual property. And, and uh, the, patent da- the patent databases are not very helpful either because they're designed to obfuscate they're, they're not intended to really clearly get across what is going on. Um, it's a legal obligation that you have to disclose your intellectual property to get a patent on it, but they do so begrudgingly. Um, whereas we would like a sort of description of these assets and projects that is actually intended to sell them, intended to you know, explain them clearly in their merits. Um, and then, then the third key piece thus far is this te- technological, legal technological piece. Uh, called an IP NFT, intellectual property, non-fungible token. And this could one day replace the patent system. It could take a while, but I think it could potentially do it. And it's basically a simple premise of putting intellectual property on the blockchain so that everybody knows what the clear ownership is. People can fractionalize it and own shares of it. uh, And they can also create a price discovery mechanism. So 
if there's a drug, for example, that is proceeding into clinical trials and we think, hey, you know, the data look really good, this should be worth more or this should be worth less. Because at present, if I wanted to bet on the success of any clinical trial or any preclinical asset, I have to buy shares in a company. And many of those companies are not publicly listed anyway. Or if I wanted specific um, exposure to one of the assets in, say, the Novartis pipeline, I can't do that right now. But if I could effectively uh, participate in ownership of a single asset within a company's pipeline, that creates a whole new marketplace. So anyway, these are some of the projects that Molecule is working on. I'll defer to the founders about more of the details, but, uh, but it's really exciting stuff. Totally. Yeah. And I maybe just to add, I think I always like the when references again as the old guy in the room, you know, I always reference kind of web, earlier web uh, innovations. And when Sebastian said, you know, the eBay, I think that's a great example, right? I mean, essentially, you know, collectibles existed, right? Or, or Airbnb is another example, you know, people have spare bedrooms like the one you're seeing behind me, right? And, and I think the, you know, essentially what Molecule is doing is, is doing this for you know, for, for drugs and for, for all the, all the, you know, amazing technology that exists at universities and, and other institutions. And that stuff is locked, you know, it, you know, within those institutions and just not made accessible in the same way that, you know, that Airbnb has done for, for, for rooms and, and houses and eBay did for various collectibles. So I think just digitizing those things, you know, bringing them online, you know, creating liquid markets for them, like Sebastian kind of described where, you know, it's, uh, you know, you can think of it like a liver, like a river, right? Like, like creating a scenario where you're just creating more rivers so where money can flow, right? It's not just, you know, Wall Street where mo the money flows. It's now literally, you know, the whole, the whole earth, you know, through uh, of money flowing through river, you know, blockchains or rivers, or, you know, you know. I think he froze. Could be a Wi Fi issue. But I, I agree. That's a good analogy. Um, it, there's no reason that Wall Street or Silicon Valley, Sand Hill Road VCs, for example, should have a monopoly on uh, funding scientific research. So, oh, you're back, Tim. Go ahead. Oh, that's it. That's it. Yeah. Just uh, just finishing the analogy. I always like thinking of analogies. If you get to know me, you'll, you'll know that. And um, I think just the, the blockchains being like kind of rivers of money that help kind of create accessibility um, to, you know, liquidity around the world. I think that's a powerful concept and it's, you know, happening in the, in the biomedical space, um, thanks to the molecule and, and people like me to do. So I think, especially in longevity, it makes sense to start with this, right? Because we've seen mm -hmm. this huge alignment between mm -hmm. the key opinion leaders in, in crypto and, and the longevity mission. Um, and it kind of makes sense. Both sort of fields have been dismissed by the incumbents and um, all these newly minted millionaires and billionaires want to have impact um, with, with their money. Now, guys, why don't we dig in a little bit further on DAOs? We're sort of talking about what we see in Molecule and what we see in VitaDAO and, and some of the lessons we've taken away, I suppose. But, you know, fundamentally, what problem is a DAO structure solving in research when we're talking about DSI? Um, maybe just a bit of an overview on that would be helpful. I'll, I'll give my uh, my least informed take because I'm sort of a, a biotech interloper in the Web3 space. Um, but I do see DAOs as sort of an alternative organizational structure, quite like the corporation was. You know, back in the 19th century, I guess, uh, corporations were created as a limited liability way to pool capital and get a certain thing done. And they actually had limited lifespans, like you wanted to build a bridge or you wanted to do whatever, a mine or something. Uh, and and uh, now they've evolved to C-Corps have taken over the world effectively and the governments. Um, and so, uh, so a, a more effective legal structure and organizational structure can absolutely change the world. And one of the problems with C-Corps, these corporations, is um, they, <laughs> they're very undemocratic. So, um, you know, the, the shareholders are other large corporations, you know, the Black Rocks of the world that, that vote on what happens. Um, and there's just this incredible concentration of power. Uh, and they're, you know, they're all on interlocking uh, boards of directors. And, you know, it's just, it's just a very clubby sort of thing. Uh, and it doesn't serve the interests of the general public. And yet we're giving them our money. Uh, we're voting with our dollars. We're investing in these companies. In fact, we're putting most of our savings into these companies through pension funds, insurance funds, your own private investments. Um, 
and 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 they're really quite undemocratic. I mean, if you've ever owned shares in these companies, you know they'll they'll have some kind of board board vote, and it's arcane and complicated. You have to be you know a, a lawyer uh, and an MBA to understand a lot of what they're talking about. Um, and so, you know, it just it just seems like a way to obfuscate and and create barriers to participation. And so DAOs are seeking to remedy that um, in that everybody has a vote. Uh, you can get paid basically in the tokens. Uh, and uh, it, it's not just proportional to, to tokens, uh, whether you can vote. We actually have sort of simple vote, voting structures that are, you know, and representatives that are um, can be called down or, or voted for. So it's really kind of integrating uh, the best aspects of, of democratic governance uh, with the efficiencies of a corporation. The other aspect is um, a lot of people don't really want to commit to a full-time job in a certain geographic location. We can allow people to work flexibly, part-time, as much as they want, at, from anywhere in the world. Um, so it's sort of a post-national organization. Uh, and, and there's no, for a DAO, there's no, like, incorporation per se. There are legal, real-world legal entities associated with the DAO. Um, but the DAO itself is decentralized and it's sort of a global citizen. Um, so these are some of the advantages that I've seen thus far. Of course, on the downside, because it's not essentially controlled, it's not like the CCP or something who just like you know um, say what you know what they want is law immediately. Um, we have to come to consensus, and we have to really get everybody on board for the decisions that we take, um, which is also good because usually people are invested because they feel that their voice actually matters. Um, but it's more difficult in terms of coordination problems. And when you get to hundreds or thousands of people involved, you have to really decentralize and, and, and be modular in that way. And that's something we're still learning, but it's gone okay so far. So with that as a framework, guys, and just move us along quickly. I mean, what have been some of the biggest takeaways, right? The biggest lessons, the biggest challenges that you've taken away from your involvement in Vita Dow over the course of the last year? Um, you know, Lawrence, if you want to take us from there. Yeah, just uh, to... to um, add something to what Sebastian was saying. Of course, there are multiple types, multiple frameworks. Um, so it, it, the cool part here is that people experiment, right? Each each DAO can be quite different. And um, the corporation was invented way before the internet, right? In the 19th century, um, people would not be able to easily add some value to to a corporation, but with DAOs and, and uh, the internet and um, group chats like Discord and so on, you can just join, add some value. Um, like especially with VitaDAO, uh, crowdsourced sort of diligence is really really powerful. You can you can get the top experts in the domain, just give their opinion on a proposal, and sourcing as well, right? You can just deploy all these people that are uh, longevity enthusiasts. They they might ask around and and find the best projects for us. Whereas in a VC fund, you would have to, right, just get a job. It's like all or nothing in a way, maybe part-time, but it's still like a binary choice. You either work for it or, or not. Here, just come join, get, add the value, and that's it. You can get tokens. So you have this, these network effects and the token, which sort of align incentives in a, in a very interesting way. And the fact that it's open and permissionless, it's like kind of like, joining a Reddit, but it has a bank account attached. So you can actually do things, not just talk about things. Um, so this whole thing scales better. And um, you asked about the, uh, the the learnings or... Yeah, just your involvement over the last year. And I'd say just, you know, quickly from each of you, what some of the highlights from each of you have been, uh, some big takeaways, some lessons, some challenges. Um, would love to hear them. Can I show a slide, actually? I think this might be quite interesting. I showed this at, at Berlin. Um, let me just share my screen here. All right, so... Um, Hat tip to Nicholas Rentdorf of LabDAO for um, sort of originating this framework, but there are functional layers in the Web3 space. Uh, one is uh, Molecule, providing the basic infrastructure layer, as we've discussed. Another is the capital allocation layer. So VitaDAO, ValleyDAO for synthetic biology and biomanufacturing, SciDAO for psychedelics and mental health, Alzheimer's DAO, which is still in early stages of incubation around alternative approaches to Alzheimer's. Um, these are like venture funds, but more democratic, and we can help launch new codes. We have an excellent network, so we can bring together entrepreneurs and all of the necessary talent from drug hunters and medicinal chemists and toxicologists to you know, um, management teams who can raise the capital. 
Um, and then this, the physical execution layer, I think is the most revolutionary here um, because we, we haven't really seen something quite like this before, but there, there have, has been an early dawn in the um, cloud lab space. So there are certain companies out there like Emerald Cloud Labs or Arcturus that heavily automate R&D um, so that you can basically click a couple of buttons, code up what experiment you want to perform out of you know, a wide menu of different types of experiments, and then it'll be executed by robots uh, or by highly specially trained humans, um, no matter where you are in the world. So if you're a scientist, and, and it has happened to me many times, you're lying in bed at night and you get this great idea, um, you don't need to, to be physically working in a lab in order to perform it, or you don't need necessarily to go out and write a grant to perform it. Um, you can just go from idea to executing the experiment much faster through this decentralized mechanism. Um, and, and because it exists in the physical world, it's harder to implement, right? I mean, it, it requires a lot more uh, CapEx, startup capital to invest in these the machinery here, but all of the pieces are in place. It's just the incentive structure. And if we can tie that to the crypto web three world, um, where all you need to do is press a couple buttons and get an experiment done, uh, you know, it, it will accelerate technological progress radically. And we're starting to see that already with a number of new projects. So anyway, I wanted to sort of establish that framework to think about. Thanks for the overview. Um, to turn again to just some of the highlights for each of you, some of the sort of learnings, takeaways um, of your involvement over the last year. Tim, uh, if you want to kick us off from there. Um, yeah, I mean, I just think in terms of learning, I mean, I think it's like anything, you know, there's definitely a, uh, you know, growth period where people have to get to know each other, you know, we're all, um, I mean, definitely historically, right. Founders, um, you know, they work together, they went to high school together or whatever. And in our case, you know, we met on the internet, right. So it's really a truly kind of digital native, um, you know, uh, founding story. And so, um, I think that's been the, probably the best part is, you know, I think in, in some ways, I mean, I've been part of kind of more traditional startups where, yeah, you meet people at, you know, through school or through, you know, just kind of through your social network. And I honestly think it works. Maybe people argue like with dating, right. Dating works better online these days and, you know, you know, meeting your, you know, your partner at the, you know, the local bar. And I think that maybe in some ways, you know, startups work better and, and crypto, the crypto ecosystem works better. We meet online, right. Just like, just like, um, and, and, you know, cause people are kind of, I think you can actually get a pretty good perspective on how people are. And of course we've met in person, you know, several times now in various parts of the world. And, um, so I think it's been really, it's been a really kind of, um, great way to just, you know, meet people from, um, anywhere in, in the world who are excited about, you know, the same things you're excited about just really opens up, um, you know, the ability to find like-minded people, you know, which are not going to be necessarily right, you know, in your, in your local community. So, I mean, I'm, I'm a professor at, at a pretty, pretty large university in, in the United States. And like, I mean, I, the number of longevity people I've met through Vita Dow and through um, just crypto in general, since there's such a big alignment, um, it's just, it's like a thousand fold compared to my, my academic network. So um, it's really, um, that's been awesome. So. Looks like Sebastian has a, a raised hand. You want to go ahead? Yeah, the decentralized nature of collaboration is really valuable. Um, it's such a you know 20th century idea that we have to be in the same academic department or in the same city or, or whatever. Um, talent is distributed all over the world. And um, you know examples are plentiful. You've got the whole open source movement, Linux. Um, you know, the Linux Apache server technology is what most, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm outdated, but, but that's what a lot of uh, infrastructure uses, right? So, so, you know, this is something that people came together to produce um, out of sheer passion and just to, just cause they were pissed off at Microsoft being a monopoly or whatever it was. Um, we're, we're pissed off about monopolies too, but we also have an incentive system that actually compensates people in various tokens and also at times in fiat uh you know we can launch new codes out of the organization pay them in fiat as well um and so people not only do are people passionate about this and dedicating their lives to longevity or whatever their cause may be it could be a rare genetic disease that they or their member of their family suffers from i actually think that will be the number one power user of these DAOs. um but 
not only is it just passion and not only is it a righteous indignation about how the legacy institutions are dropping the ball on us, but we can actually profit from it. We can share in, in the spoils of success financially because we have a clear roadmap and examples of uh, value accumulation around these, these assets. I mean, we figured out all of the major pieces such that you know these DAOs can, can continue to grow and compensate their early members. So um, I think it's an incredibly powerful combination of, of uh, sit, uh, incredibly powerful situation. Lawrence, go ahead. Yeah, I, I got to say, I've been surprised by the growth in, in DeSci as a whole. Initially, I just thought, well, it just makes sense. United Crypto and Longevity, um, sorry about that, it, uh, bring just funding in a new way, bottom-up approach um, to have more diversity, young, uh, fund the young researchers as well, fund more innovative ideas instead of just small iterations and, and so on. But uh, one of the things that I've learned over the past year that uh, since you asked um, is this idea of reaching consensus, but without necessarily having unanimity and requiring unanimity, but rather um, trying to have a decision-making process for a group. Um, one I like is the modified uh, consensus process, um, which takes some learnings from sociocracy and, and um, a few other places. And it, it's quite simple, but the point is, um, we, we try to usually have consensus, and when there isn't, uh, at least the minority, uh, feel, they have to feel listened to, and then at the end, um, they, they give in if, if it's obvious that the majority would, would win. And we sort of all kind of, um, we, we don't force decisions uh, on, on the minority. Um, that's, that's a big learning that I hadn't uh, thought about before and with democracy as well. Balaji Srinivasan, another key opinion leader uh, that is also in longevity and crypto, um, is, is sort of talking about this concept of 100% democracy versus 51% democracy, right? You can, you can, if you don't like the new tax policy or whatever, ideally you have the freedom to just take your yourself and your assets and everything and just move uh, to a place where you have that. And with DAOs, it's, it's, it's very easy to do that and with working groups as well within DAOs and, and squads and so on. Got it. Uh, you know, zooming out a bit now for our last big question that I think I've got for this conversation, I think we should talk about what we see for the future of BioDAOs more generally. What's on the horizon? What should people expect? Uh, you know, I think this would be a great opportunity to hear about projects like LabDAO, SciDAO, uh, any other projects people might find interesting. Sure, I can uh, give a brief overview of LabDAO, although it probably won't do justice. You should talk to Nick. Um, <clears throat> so the physical execution, so if we're going to basically um, opt out of the current system and remove ourselves from it to the greatest extent possible, I mean, we're happy to still collaborate with the current system to the extent that it's mutually beneficial. However, we don't want to be reliant on this system. This is an exercise in radical self-reliance, right? As is all crypto at its best. Um, and so you know, we, we have the infrastructure layer in place with Molecule. We have the funding layer in place with VitaDAO and these other orgs. With LabDAO, this is um, the most challenging, but also I think the most potentially impactful, is setting up a network of uh, physical labs uh, that can perform basically any experiment that you need, focusing on drug discovery, uh, but ultimately can be basic research as well and can even go beyond biology if you so please. Um, and, and we don't have to reinvent the wheel. So Tim mentioned the Airbnb sort of business model. We've got all this excess capacity. <laughs> and uh, you know there are, there are pieces of equipment and incredible experts within academia and within biotech companies uh, that are not being used to their full potential. So, you know, one of the perverse things that happens, <laughs> we should do a whole episode on the perverse incentives, but one of them is, this happens in government, happens in academia too. You have a certain budget. And if you don't blow through that entire budget in a given year, you won't get a budget increase, or maybe they'll even cut your budget. And so your incentive is to spend it all before the end of the year. And so a lot of academics, they will buy some shiny new piece of equipment just because they, they have the cash on hand. Um, 
And then it's, it sits unused, lying fallow for, you know, 90% of the time. Um, and so if we could find a way for them to monetize that excess capacity uh, and, and put it to good use, you know, it's incredible gains in efficiency, like what Airbnb did to the hotel industry. Uh, and, and I think the margins are, are probably higher in, in our business as well. This has been tried before. Uh, there are other organizations, but it hasn't failed yet. So I shouldn't say it's been tried before, but uh, there are organizations that are earlier uh, than us. Um, Science Exchange is one of them. And, and these are great organizations, but they're not crypto enabled and they're not as technologically enabled and they're not plugged into these funding layer DAOs. Um, and so we're happy to work with them, but we, we basically want to rebuild it from the ground up. Uh, so LabDAO is building this uh, network of capabilities in existing labs all over the world, and then building some of their own sort of uh, cloud lab capabilities. And I'm trying to get them to build in uh, the first one in Puerto Rico because it's a 50% cash back R&D credit uh, in cash. But anyway, so that's a bit of uh, what LabDAO is doing. I'll um, let the other guys explain some of the other DAOs. Yeah, the, the DeSai landscape is, is growing so fast, I can't keep up. The, uh, there's so many projects. Uh, Saida was working on uh, psychedelics research. Um, I'm, I would like to see, I haven't seen yet, but I would love to see uh, that I was working on uh, distributed trials. Um, so, so we don't need to rely on this, these sort of centralized uh, regulators and bureaucracy as the default. I would love to see, you know, rigorous distributed trials that are either in friendly jurisdictions or or can be bootstrapped if they don't exist. Uh, on the sort of um, scientific publishing and peer review, there are some uh, like like Research Hub and um, and I think DCI Foundation is working there as well. Maybe even grants for more more basic research. So so because I was focusing on the translation aspect, but uh, what about the basic research where we don't want the NIH to still be um, the, the one calling the shots there in a, in a bureaucratic sort of centralized manner and to only entrenched PIs. Uh, and we want things to be, of course, much faster because I'm super excited to see PIs and, and the top scientists sort of not spending 80% of their time uh, writing grants like they do now, but rather more high level um, ideas on, on how to design experiments and, and so on. So yeah, more funding, more projects, fast funding, um, innovation on, on sort of the um, all, all aspects from basic research to, to clinical trials, right? From all across the pipeline. Um, there are many ideas that are new um, that haven't been tried before, I think, like retroactive funding for public goods uh, impact certificates for um, more like speculation on, on what science will be successful. Maybe some prediction markets, if we can figure out the downsides there um, and the dangers. And um, the ideas around the token bonding curves that were popular a few years ago when I first got into DAOs, um, but fell out of favor a little bit. And in general, I'd love to see, I'm quite disappointed. I, I love the scientific method and I'm quite disappointed in, in biology and biotech in general. Um, it's, it's mostly trying to uh, validate uh, their hypotheses instead of trying to falsify things. Um, so we want more falsifiable experiments. Of course, it's really hard, um, but uh, science can, can improve a lot. I think when, when people actually care as a community about the outcome uh, instead of, getting rich quick. Yeah, and maybe just to throw in a few more shout outs to some groups. Um, so the Bi Bio is tackling um, the rare disease space. Um, they just raised $12 million recently. Crowdfunded Cures is really interesting. They're doing pay for success trials. Everyone should definitely look up what those are. That's where essentially some of, I think what Lawrence was kind of just getting at is like, like we're, we're not really getting the outcomes we want. Um, and so you want to, the people who should be funding the clinical trials are people who would get benefit, you know, if the, if the trial did show, you know, the data that you want. So for example, 
Um, an employer, you know, who has a bunch of unhealthy employees, you know, pay for to take a drug, which will improve their health. Like for example, metformin, which is a, a big diabetes drug, but, but, you know, is thought to have a lot of health span um, effects in general. So if those employees took that drug and they got healthier, of course, their bills would be less. So it actually, it would make sense for an employer to, to pay for a trial for that, for that medicine, because it would improve their, um, you know, kind of bo their bottom line as well as their employees um, health. So um, I think uh, in general, more generally, I think, again, the crypto, I've said this at the beginning, but just in general that we, we, the DSI movement is, you know, hopefully we're all looking to areas where the incentives are just not there, whether it's in publishing or funding or, or whatever, um, you know, there's just, you know, there's no liquidity, there's no, there's no money, there's no, you know, there's no community. Right. And I think, you know, crypto can, can help solve all those, all those, um, all those things and kind of bring people together. So. Sebastian, uh, go ahead. So um, I wanted to bring it back to the sort of big picture uh, mission of DSI, uh, at least from my perspective. There are two, two big problems that I think we need to solve. Uh, the first is dogma in academia, dogma that everybody is forced, you know, used to be by the Catholic Church, but now by certain authorities, uh, scientific authorities, to believe prescribed truths. The other is, the other problem uh, is incrementalism. So low risk research, just to crank out another publication that very few people read or understand um, in order to get tenure and advance your career. Um, and, and this is linked to the precariousness of the academic life, which is really unfair because you have very smart, very competent people just kind of getting screwed over by the academic system because it's all they know or because they think it's prestigious or whatever. Um, and so I see how DSI can resolve both of those. One, dogma, um, it's letting a thousand flowers bloom. We fund the stuff that is uh, unfashionable or heretical, unorthodox. Uh, and the other is with incrementalism, we only like to fund those things that have potentially massive outsized impact. Um, and to give you one example of, of how this can really go wrong, over the last roughly 30 years, 40 years, there's been the amyloid hypothesis. And this is uh, a theory about the pathology of Alzheimer's disease, what causes Alzheimer's disease, which is rising rapidly as the population ages. Um, and there's a really good article from Stat News, S-T-A-T, about how this dogma was actively enforced uh, by the leading academics in the space, you know, top institutions, the NIH and Harvard and et cetera. Uh, and they suppressed research into alternative competing theories and they swept under the rug evidence that the, their favorite hypothesis is wrong. And lo and behold, pharma has spent tens of billions of dollars on clinical trials that flop one after the other going after amyloid beta or tau. Uh, and, you know, and nobody can say anything about it. And nobody was able to get funding for anything outside of that prescribed dogma. You had to fit your, your academic grant into that worldview just to get funded. And now, thank God, the tables are turning because the NIH is not funding as much amyloid work. The Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation is not funding amyloid at all. Uh, but it still takes a long time to work through the system. So anyway, this, this is one area we can really help, which is supporting iconoclastic researchers who are not really surviving in academia because they're not kissing the right ass or, you know, just towing the line. Uh, so, so it's really sort of this sort of libertarian mission uh, of um, criticizing whatever is, is the, the dominant entity. Thanks for uh, for putting a bow on that. Guys, I think we're nearly out of time here, but just as a parting question and as information for anyone listening in who's interested, how can people get involved? You know, Tim, actually, I think uh, you might have a good perspective on this as someone who has uh, some roots in academia and traditional research. Yeah, I think it's as simple as going on Twitter, finding people in Discord, you know, just being online and you know, being present. I mean, a lot of us, yeah, a lot of the activities on, on various discords. I mean, a lot of DAOs have discords. Um, yeah, just being online. And I mean, it should be, it should, you know, it's pretty permissionless um, as, as someone said earlier. So, it, you know, anyone can join and definitely it's just about taking initiative. And 
it's the way kind of things should be. Your credentials don't matter. Um, so yeah, just kind of find find whatever you find interesting on uh, on the internet. So yeah, show us show us that you care. Show us that you're relentless. Um, and um, introduce yourself. You know, don't be a don't be a stranger. Um, one for example of, of some examples of tasks you can do source a project if you're an expert maybe help us review a project we have a governance forum where we we post the more advanced ones but you can also ask like hey what what is out there what can i help with and uh well another project that we're we're sort of spearheading soon is the fractionalization of ip nfts so you can help us with with sort of uh launching a, a sub community for each sort of um research project that we funded in the past to fractionalize that um yeah and many things and always just yeah don't be a stranger ask us what what you can do and uh, there will always be things to do and uh happy birthday to to Vida Dao because we have uh just a few days ago we had the anniversary so Sebastian go ahead and close us out cheers yeah so um we've only scratched the surface of what Vida Dao is up to and of course these other DAOs um, but I would invite everybody to check out the website. And we also have a presentation uh, that we can share with you that goes into more detail. Um, and really, the uh, organization is all about all of the people we have on board already uh, and the projects that we have funded already, as well as all of the projects in the pipeline. And uh, so you can learn more about those. We've got an autophagy project that we funded in the UK. We have a mitophagy and Alzheimer's project that we funded in Norway. Uh, we have a project in Copenhagen that takes advantage of this incredible resource of a, a Danish government database of all of the drugs that people are taking and whether those drugs extend lifespan. Um, and we've got a handful of other projects, sort of a, um, an early teaser. We have a project uh, around extracellular matrix and related to how uh, naked mole rats don't get cancer and live 30 years as compared to three or four years for regular rats share most of the same uh, genome or a lot of similarities in their genome, uh, but yet they don't get cancer and yet they live 10 times as long. Um, and, and there are some druggable targets involved there. So anyway, invite you guys to get involved, join the Discord. Uh, we have sort of a, a package that we can share with people that orients people on actually how the incentive structures work, how you can get compensated for your time, how the voting works uh, and everything. So yeah, don't be a stranger. We welcome everybody. You don't have to have any uh, scientific training, many of us do. Um, but you know, if you're just competent in a certain area, uh, we're happy to have you on board. Oh, and and another thing, not just uh, this is not just for individuals, right? If you work in a certain organization, we are are now sort of welcoming institutional contributors as well, pharma companies, VC funds that we can sort of co-partner with. The first, for example, the first um, fund that we've partnered with. Uh, publicly is Apollo Health Ventures that Sebastian was involved with. It's the biggest VC fund in the longevity space. And we have a few others that we're sort of collaborating with so that they can help us uh, do the company building after the asset is mature enough for further investments, uh, but also uh, pharma companies that will be announced soon. And yeah, if you, if you work in, in any such organizations that could uh, sort of vibe with us, please let us know. And also a shout out to academics and applicants for these grants. Um, the grants are very simple to submit. They're not a complex NIH grant. Uh, uh, we have a, a framework for, for those and we can make decisions in under a month. Uh, and so feel free to submit. It has to be longevity related, has to work for multiple age related diseases and ideally target one of the known hallmarks of aging. Um, and there has to be some sort of intellectual property that can result. We do fund basic research, but uh, our main focus is, is translational R&D drug discovery. Um, and then organizations, you know, pharmas and biotechs, we can do asset-based financing. So if you have a project that you, you think is interesting, but you don't have enough money for, we can come in and, and finance that project to the next milestone. And we're also interested in out-licensing from pharma. And we've had a couple of discussions with established pharmas, out-licensing some of the assets that are sitting on the shelf there. Great, guys. Well, thank you for the time. This has been a great conversation. Appreciate everybody sitting down together, and I uh, hope we can do this again sometime. 
Thanks for tuning in. As always, this podcast is brought to you by Molecule. If you have any questions and want to get into a deeper discussion about today's topic, feel free to visit our Twitter or Discord. You can find all the important links in the description and show notes below. Also, if you're a researcher seeking funding, if you want to start working in a biotech DAO, or if you're an investor, please visit our website, molecule.to, for more information. Thanks again for tuning in. Stay healthy, be well, and see you again very soon.